seven, nine, eight, two, nine. Nine, uh, four, five, seven, nine, eight, two, nine.
30, minus 36 degrees that day. To set the tone of the time, my mother and I were in the hospital for 12 days. Wow. And the bill was $48. <laughs> Nowadays, you go in for eight hours and it costs you 8000 <laughs> We lived on Back Windham Road, which is really in West Hamilton, on a small self-sustaining farm, still there today. We had no electricity or telephone until 1947, and that was a big deal. I do remember, most, most kids don't remember what happened at five years old unless it was really traumatic. Well, when that first light bulb came on, it was traumatic because I remember that. <laughs> we had running water from a spring on the hill, which ran into the house and into a copper lined wood box with cover on it in the kitchen. When the box filled, it would overflow through a pipe, through the wall, to the outside. We had to keep this water running all the time, otherwise it would freeze between the house and the spring, and you'd never get it thawed out until springtime. I must mention that the pipe that delivered the water to the house was lead. Oh. That was very common at that time. Reason being, I think, is because all those water lines were dug by hand. And when you hit a rock, you had to go around it, or under it, or over it, and the lead pipe would bend. There was no such thing as plastic pipe then. So that's the way it was done. And so if I act a little bit funny. <laughs> <laughs> so if you kept the reservoir in the kitchen stove full of water, you had plenty of hot water for most everything. We dipper it out of the box. You know, you just had to do that all the time. The kitchen stove pretty much ran 24/7, and even through the summer, because. That's the only way we, we could have hot water, and that's what we cooked on, because we didn't have electric stoves. And uh, so that hot water is for baths and cooking. It had also heat the house, especially the kitchen, because the kitchen in those old farmhouses were huge, because you did everything in the kitchen. And then laundry day came. What an ordeal that was. <laughs> we were lucky. We had a Maytag gasoline washer. Oh, wow. <laughs> it, it was a motor that sat on the washing machine. Big flywheel. Wow. And you had to step on it to start it. Most, most of the time my mother couldn't do it, so my father had to do it. And uh, I don't know if you call it a one motor or what. But before you put a load on it, flywheel would spin and then fire every once in a while. You put a load on it, and then it'd muckle down and keep on going. And it was loud. <laughs> and you stuck the exhaust through the window. You had a piece of flexible pipe. And you did your washing. So with the kitchen stove and the wood stove in the living room, we heated the whole house. So we were pretty busy all year cutting, stacking, splitting wood. And the, there were grates in the grates in the uh, ceiling that went to each bedroom to take that warm air upstairs. And as most houses of that era, none of them were insulated. 
so it was cold. I don't care how how you get to the stove, the hump it, it was still cold. I remember many times getting up, and if I took a glass of water, then it was frozen in the morning. Bedtime was warm because the house had been heating all day. And when you got into bed, you jumped into a foot of feathers, a feather tick. And that was really nice. And then you put a, a six-inch comforter on the top, and you were snug as a bug in a rug. And you hated to get up in the morning. <laughs> If my father had tended the business during the night, then the house might be warm because <laughs> you had to get up and soak those tires. Otherwise, it would be cold in the morning. And we did have some cold mornings. We raised, we raised most of our food. We had chickens, beef, pork, rabbits, and veggies. Of course, the chickens gave us eggs, the beef, buttermilk cream, and we also had maple syrup and maple sugar. We had no freezers. So everything had to be canned. Now if you don't think that's a job, try canning a whole beef. But I loved it. Canned beef was, oh, that was good. You know, you could just take it out of a jar and slice it, put it in the sandwich, and eat it. And, uh, we had an ice box, but they didn't amount so much. You could keep stuff for maybe a day or two, but then you'd lose your ice, and water ran all over the floor. It really wasn't that cold. Uh, pork was either salt cured, sugar cured, and smoke, which, which we did ourselves. We butchered the beef in the, at the start of the winter when it was cold and hung it up in the woodshed. And when you wanted a piece of beef, you simply went out and cut it off and cooked it. When it warmed up, you had to stop everything and can it. So we were always hoping January thaw would come. <laughs> In 1947, I started school in West Townsend. The school bus was a Model A Ford, and Walter Van Ness was the school bus driver. Sometimes Walter Van Ness's father would drive it. And they were big, big men. They were blacksmiths, and uh, they were scary. <laughs> the ride down, this ride down the hill probably made it scary. The ride down Wyndham Hill in 1947 in the Model A was so scary. The road was just wide enough for one car. And, and if you've ever been down Wyndham, back Wyndham Road, it's narrow now, but it's twice as wide as it was. And you're looking straight down like that. So whenever I got on the downhill side of the vehicle, I quickly moved to the other, because I was sure I was going to roll it over. And one day we saw a log truck that hadn't rolled over. So that even scared us more. I think that guy name was Burby. There was a Burby around here that did logging. Next page. In 1954, my parents sold the farm and we moved to Southwind. Now we're in winter. By this time, I had two brothers and two sisters. We could now walk to school because our school was right there in town. And it was one room, one teacher, eight grades. I was the 
only one in my class from the sixth grade to the eighth grade. A good friend of mine and myself were avid fishermen. He was the grandson of Harry Hall, if you remember Harry Hall. This was Skip Hall, and he and I just fished all the time. <laughs> and I don't know how we did it, but we made a deal with the teacher. Fishing started on the 1st of May. We made a deal with the teacher. She would come in at 4 in the morning with us, and we could get out early to go fishing. <laughs> I, I got a little note here. It says, yay, teach. <laughs> Who would do that now? Probably no one. You couldn't. <laughs> this is a good time to mention that Windows was famous for muddy roads. Most of our roadside snow walls are pretty much gone now because they ended up in the road. Yeah. You get stuck, you jack up the car, you go to the snow wall, put them under the tires, <laughs> and then take off to the next mud hole where you repeat the whole process. <laughs> Done it many times. Then they wonder where the cell walls went to. <laughs> In 1956, I went to Chester High School. Graduated in 1960. I did a year of college at Guilford College in Greensboro, North Carolina. Imagine that. Talk about culture shock. <laughs> From Wyndham to Greensboro, North Carolina in 1960. I did not go back the following year. <laughs> no way. Then the following year I got talked into working in New York City, of all places. Very near the UN building. At lunch I would walk over to the UN building and we had an hour and watch all the processes going on. And I just happened to be there when Khrushchev started pounding the desk. So that was interesting. <laughs> I lived in Brooklyn and commuted each day to Manhattan during rush hour. I decided that was no way to live and was home by Christmas. I eventually met my future wife of 55 years. Started work at a machine shop in Springfield, where I worked for 21 years. We built a house on London Hill Road, back in Wisconsin. <laughs> Not back way up, but the front way up. <laughs> and we stayed there for 14 years. And that's where we brought up our two sons. They went to the only gray. <clears throat> and at, after the 14 years, we sold the house and bought a piece of land in Wyndham and built the house in Wyndham. So now we're back in Wyndham. <laughs> and that's where we live today. I made a big mistake. I went to the first town meeting of my life in 1980 in Wyndham. I was nominated and elected to the flight <laughs> where I served for 30 years. Somewhere back there, in this whole thing, I shot a big deer. 1976, I think. I couldn't justify spending the money to have it mounted, so I did it myself. All my deer hunting friends said, you're going to do mine next time. I said, that's not bad. And I'm still doing it. I've probably done a lot of your kids and husbands. I've never done it. I, I retired from Stratton in 2013 and still dabble in my taxidermy.
the uh, person used to have uh, an old eight, I guess it's eight millimeter camera with uh, old reels on them. And we used to go down there on a Saturday night or something and we'd see Laurel and Harding and the three Stooges and Abbott and Costello. We, one night, and some nights we'd walk, but other nights we'd my dad would take us and uh, we went one night and I guess we wanted to ride home so Alan he called the house and at that time the old phone number was uh, three line ring three and you cranked it so but anyway he called and uh, my dad I think he knew who it was but he said uh, Who's calling anyway? <laughs> Alan says, uh, A-L-A-N and the boys. <laughs> we, uh, we had a lot of animals to tend to and my dad took us hunting a lot. We had a hunting camp, or my dad had a hunting Alan and I used to go, we stayed quite often, and uh, we made a lot of trips in the woods, either in hunting or just looking for timber, and, and uh, just had a good time growing up. And then my dad uh, used to go around, he had a well, he had a lot of cattle, but he uh, would pick up people's cat, uh, cattle or horses or pigs or chickens or goats, anything they wanted to sell. And every Thursday and Friday, uh, Thursday and Saturday, we'd go for, to an auction in Dallas Falls. And uh, I did that for helped him for lots of years and uh, we used to, he'd get the big critters and I'd get the little ones and we'd load them and go to the auctions. And uh, one, uh, I guess I left out too that when we, my dad first started, he had an old Buick engine that run a sawmill and uh, Kerosene was cheaper than gasoline, so my dad, he was a good mechanic, he, uh, he put a tank up with kerosene in it, and uh, he had a gas tank on the side, and he would start the Buick engine on gasoline, and then shut the valve off on the gas, and turn the kerosene on, and it would run the mill, but when he went to shut it off, it was so hot he couldn't turn it off. He'd have to turn the gas back on and shut the kerosene. <laughs> but, but it was cheaper. But that's the way it worked. And then he went from old Buick engine out of a car to a to a steam engine, and that was a real big had eight foot fly wheels on it that run the sawmill. And I used to go with him because uh, you had to, if you had a steam engine, you had to fire it constantly all winter long or it would freeze the water. So from the time I was little, I'd go with him to the mill on the weekends. And one time I went with him and I wasn't very big in the door where they fired the wood and such. It was always cold. And uh, I had, luckily, I had my hood on and I didn't have mittens on. He was going to start a fire that morning and he threw a bunch of things in the fire and then he threw some kerosene in. Oh. And I don't know if you know what kerosene does. <laughs> it made a big 
big white cloud. And just as I made that big white cloud, I stepped up to the door. It was both hands to look in. And the thing oh, yeah, hit me right in the face. And, uh, luckily, I had a hood, and, but I didn't have any eyelashes left. Or it didn't have any. It could have been worse. <laughs>
and Dr. Gordon and Marilyn, and they had uh, Mike and uh, Mike and Gloria. Mike used to help us at the mill, and he invited me out to go swimming out about a uh, while or so. We had an old crank up record player, and they had a high five. He put on this record, it was uh, Leroy Anderson's. I never forgot it, a, a bugless holiday and a tumbler lullaby. And uh, I couldn't wait, and I got into high school in 1956. I started taking lessons. Burton Martin was a music teacher, and uh, I had him for a year and a half, and he had a better job. He went to Bellas Falls, but I wanted to play, and uh, then Dick, and, uh, Dick Perry came, and he was a music teacher for the next few years. But uh, some of the funny things that have happened over the years, I've met lots of people with music, and uh, I was thinking about the New Payne Barn up here. I played Friday nights up in Landro for Doug Roberts. We played from 9 till 1. And then Saturday night, I came down to New Payne Barn, and we came down here and dance. And that's how I, my sister, both my sisters were there one night, and they met uh, my wife at a day that she was there with some girlfriends. And so I went to Fort Dix, and I met her last Christmas at the uh, dance in uh, Jamaica at the, uh, at the square dance. Some of the funny things that happened, uh, Paul Lockhoy moved up from Hartford, Connecticut, and he played the upright bass. He was a really funny guy. And uh, we were playing at the barn one night, my dad and me, we had a little gin and brandy in the freezer. <laughs> and uh, they passed it out to us. We took a little nip, and Paul said, what's that? We told him what he was. He said, give me a drink of that. So he took some. Pretty soon, about an hour or so gone by, and we got that bottle up again. I said, he said, hey, give me some land. I said, you like it? He said, I guess I like it. He said, I've been to the bathroom twice. I hadn't even left the barn. <laughs> he, he told me, he, he was quite a joke teller. He told me about this guy. He was in a car accident. And uh, he was in a coma for a couple of weeks. And he got better. He got back home. And he got the bill. It was real, a lot of money for the all the medical expenses. But they charged him 2500 for food. <laughs> he said, I'll pay the medical expense, but he said, I'm not paying for the food to let in the coma. And he went down and he was giving them really a hard time at the office. His head nurse come along, she said, what's going on? He said, I'll tell you what's going on. I'll pay for the medical expense, but I'm not paying for the food because I couldn't have eaten. She said, oh, yes, you did. He said, I don't believe it, you're lying. She said, wait a minute. She went down and she said, would you like a cup of coffee like you used to have it? He said, boy, I would. So she went down and came back had this animal bag and she unhooked it, she poured the coffee in, the sugar and cream, and she shook it all up. She said, okay, bend over. <laughs> she said, you heard what I said, and she hit him hard with that animal, and he said, oh my God. She said, he said, what's the matter, was it too hot? He said, no, it's too sweet. <laughs> Sometimes people come in the mill and they said, what's your name? I said, Alan. They said, Alan? I said, not today. I feel pretty good. <laughs> Somebody asked me one time, they said, do you grade your lumber? I said, yeah, we have two grades, real good and real bad. <laughs> we were, Kathy, me and my folks were playing over in uh, Newport at my cousin's wedding. And uh, this guy came up to me, an old guy, he was pretty well sales, and he said, uh, you know something? You don't exactly play like Harry James. I said, you don't dance much like Arthur Mary either. Oh, somebody, sometime we were at a, they were showing some old pictures and they had this sled with a 2,600 feet of lumber on it. It said 2,600 feet aboard feet. Somebody said, what's a board foot? I said, that's what's on the end of a wooden leg. <laughs> <laughs> this, lady, this lady called me one time. She said, do you sell a one by 12 point? I said, yes, I sell one by 12 point. I said, what are you doing with it? She said, I'm gonna put it down for a floor. I said, well, I'll tell you, have you ever used pine? She said, no, but I like it. I said, it's pretty soft wood. I said, if you walk on it with high heels, 
you're going to leave marks all over it. She said, let me tell you something, Sonny. I don't wear high heels and neither is my husband. <laughs> I said, I'm proud of it. <laughs> but uh, where my, my dad had a mill up on, uh, he started another mill besides the one he had with a chair shop. And uh, the, my brother Milt was signed up there. We went to work. Around 1960, I think it was, the whole place was on fire. Dad lost everything uh, up on that hill. And then in 1971, <coughs> where we got the mill, uh, there was a flash flood up back. Didn't bother the other part of town that came down through. And two of my brothers were stranded on the sawdust pile. Never me were trying to move lumber away. But it uh, did a lot of damage, didn't do any other damage to the town. And uh, uh, Raymond Robinson was coming up too with his wife, and luckily they had a big view if the sun was out. And the uh, uh, lumber and stuff went, uh, some uh, slab went through in front of them, pretty they put them into the river there. And uh, people couldn't believe it, and they thought it. it was like a, just half up back where I think a beaver dam let go off in the back. But uh, that was quite a quite an experience. But uh, in all, it's uh, it's been a good life, like that movie there. And uh, I got my trumpet. I got a song I was going to play, and if any of you know it, you can sing along with it.
to meet a Leitner, his mother, and his father was also Dietrich Stolte, uh, nicknamed Deed. And uh, at that time in Germany, uh, there was a lot of social upheaval. Uh, Germany at the time was sort of a, a collection of relatively unorganized states. But coming to power was Kaiser Wilhelm I. And he appointed as his chancellor um, Otto von Bismarck. I'm sure many of you have heard the name of Bismarck. Um, he began to militarize everything and created a great social structure, but always around the military. And it was with that in mind that my great grandfather decided to move his entire family to America. So he pulled up roots in Germany and came first to Pennsylvania. They checked out Pittsburgh, said that was no place to raise children, and moved up to Brattleboro, searching for a proper place to live. And Brattleboro was the place they settled. And my great grandfather was a master cigar maker. And he took a job at uh, a cigar store in Brattleboro where they made their own product. It was called Roos Cigar Store. And he worked there for about 35 years, made his whole uh, career there. And back then at that time, of course, just being a cigar maker, uh, he was able to raise a family of seven children, buy a house, pay for it all. And uh, of course, uh, my great grandmother was busy at home with a pile of children and all that went with that back in those days. But you have to think how times have changed when a man could support a family of that size and own a house uh, on a salary that a cigar maker would have made. Um, but at any rate, it was there in Brattleboro that, uh, that Deed Stolta uh, began a career. This is young Deed, Deed Jr. And he went through the Brattleboro area schools and uh, graduated high school in Brattleboro. And uh, the YMCA was a very big deal throughout the state, actually throughout New England, back in those days. And he um, uh, was an active member of the YMCA in Brattleboro and became, uh, through that uh, association, very deeply interested in, in, in athletics and decided to make it his career choice. So he completed a, a course there in Brattleboro at the YMCA and thereafter took a job over in Nashua, Nashua New Hampshire managing a YMCA athletic program there. Led him then to go to the YMCA college in Springfield, Massachusetts. And he graduated there and then began a serious career uh, around different places including uh, a two-year stint in, in Nova Scotia uh, uh, teaching athletics full time. Eventually, he realized that if he wanted to um, really take his, his, uh, his career of choice to its ultimate heights, he needed to know a lot more about human physiology. So he decided to go to medical school. And by that time, his brother Dan, who was my grandfather, uh, was also interested in medicine. And the two men both went down to Baltimore, Maryland, and went attended a four-year program in the, uh, at, at the Baltimore uh, Medical College. Um, while they were there, uh, they were both one afternoon engaged in the pickup game at the school of some sort. And this is family legend as to how this happened. But um, they had not been prepared with a gym bag and everything for what took place. So after the event was over um, and they showered up, they borrowed a towel from somebody and wiped themselves down and dressed and went home. The result of that being, this, and this is according to family life, and I don't think this has ever been proven medically, but both brothers contracted a virus that affected their eyes. And um, my grandfather was legally blind. I mean, he made a career nonetheless. Uh, and uh, Deed was also uh, affected. His sight was affected very badly so that they could not do a dissection at the medical school, and they had to discontinue their medical studies. Well, coming back to Brattleboro, both men took a job at the Dung Shoe Company down on Cottonmill Hill. My grandfather continued to work there for 45 years. Dean worked there for several years and coached part-time at uh, Brattleboro High School. And back then, it wasn't a full-time position. They went in and, and coached uh, seasonally. Um, 
But after he had done that for about five years, he produced such remarkable results with the athletic teams in Hillsboro that the board got together and decided to offer him a full-time staff position. And he coached all sports. I mean, it was football, basketball, track and field. And in the summers, he uh, taught swimming to all the Brownboro area kids. Uh, and that included, of course, instruction for boys and girls alike. Um, he was deeply devoted to this undertaking and built many state championship teams out of Brattleboro High School material. And the success of his career was based on the very personal, intense friendships he built, built with all the kids that he trained. And uh, it was uh, after he had done that for quite a number of years, um, he, uh, after he'd done that for quite a number of years, he took his uh, high school basketball team to the state competition up in Rutland, the state championships. And it was there that uh, his team had built up a very significant lead over the, Lud the Ludlow High School team that they were playing. And it was in the um, later part of the game that he called a timeout to give some final instruction to his boys. They came over, surrounded him, he gave them the instruction, sent them back out on the floor, and as they were running back out on the floor, Deed's head snapped back and he hit the floor, stone cold dead. There were doctors in the house that rushed down, there were over a thousand people in attendance at the game, they rushed down, there was nothing anyone could do. Um, the, the director of the, of the uh, championship uh, match uh, had everyone stand uh, for over a full minute in silence, and then all together they recited the Lord's Prayer. Um, the Brattleboro boys were weeping openly, and it was decided by the by the authority of the match, they should discontinue the game. But the, but, the, but the Brattleboro boys said no. They knew the deed would want them to go on, and they went ahead, and they had built up such a sizable deed that although they were quite devastated by this horrific event, they uh, finished the game and won, but they all returned the next day to Brattleboro, escorting Deed's body back to the town. Um, it was clear to everyone in the town that there was no church in Brattleboro large enough to hold the number of people that would want to attend his funeral service. So they decided to hold the service in the armory, which is now the Gibson Aiken Center in Brattleboro. And I've seen a picture of the three to four hundred people that could not fit into the armory out on the street when they held the service. It was a uh, a uh, very memorable event, and uh, I never knew Deed, but uh, my mother did, and was very close to him. She was about 16 years old when he died, but what she remembered that really impressed her was her mom, my grandmother, um, was a full-blooded Scot, had grown up on Prince Edward Island, eventually wound up settling in Brattleboro, marrying my grandfather. But being a Scot, was a, she was a marvelous woman, but she was not someone who expressed her emotions easily. And I remember her distinctly at one point uh, at home when we were talking, I forget how the subject turned that way at a dinner, but it was turned to, you know, uh, as sometimes will, what happens to someone when or if someone dies? And I remember my mother saying, well, I don't know how I'll cope with it, mother, if, if you should die. And she said, well, I'll tell you one thing, Mary, she said to my mother. If you cry at my funeral, she said, I will come back and haunt you. <laughs> she had no use for tears. But what impressed my mother at the time of Dean's funeral was she said that was the only time in her life when she saw her mother actually break down and weep. And that was the way the whole town seemed to feel about him. Uh, thereafter, and until pretty recently, the athletic field at Brattleboro High School was named Stolta Field. 
Now I believe that designation is only for the baseball diamond, uh, not for the whole athletic complex. But I know that each year now, at graduation, the Stolta Cup is still given out to the boy and girl who most exemplify the ideals that Dean Stolta uh, harbored in his, in his concept of what it was to be a sportsman. I mean, it was for him, it was a lifestyle. It was, it was the way you comported yourself, either in victory or defeat, as a gentleman, as a courteous person, and you were in it for the ability to compete, not necessarily the ability to win. And uh, he believed it was a way you could train young people to lead a good and virtuous life. And, um, and that's, the, that's the story I brought with me tonight. I, I have dozens more, but I think we're right on the button here as to being uh, ready to wrap up. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, the stories of the end are terrific stories, and I love telling them, and I hope that this, uh, I'm sorry, to end, you know, end the evening on sort of a less than comic one, because this story, the other story I had to tell you tonight did end with a joke, um, and a good one. But I mean, at any rate, there may be, may be another, what's that? Okay, I'll tell you a story from the end. I call this, I call this story, if, you can, if, you can, if anybody has to leave, don't hesitate. I, I call this story how Christian Genkhoff discovered he was a funny man. Chris Genkhoff came to the inn for many years, almost all the years that I worked at the inn. He was a, a man of relatively small stature. He was about five foot five, maybe six inches tall, very thin, um, very disciplined, very controlled man, um, very courteous, nice, had a pleasant demeanor, but wasn't really a guy he joked around with much. And he was a man who built his life on minuscule, ironclad disciplines. He always ate breakfast at the same time. He always had his two martinis before dinner at exactly the same time, always sitting in the same chair in the lounge. To the point that guests at one point, some guests that he didn't even know, found out who he was, because they'd seen him here year after year, night after night, uh, during his stay at the bar, and they got a little brass plaque that said, this chair belongs to Christian Gamble, and they affixed it to the back of the chair. But he was an interesting guy, and he uh, made his living working for a big law firm down in New York City, and he was an estate's lawyer, and you can imagine that that was just the place for him. I mean, scrutinizing detail in a way that you just can't imagine. Well, there was another fellow that came to the end, uh, and Chris and this other fellow had never crossed paths. Now the other fellow was physically exactly the opposite from Chris. His name was Harry Downey, and he was 75% Mohawk Indian. He was about six foot six inches, six inches tall, long and really craggy bony features, tremendous hands, huge hands. And he was one of the most affable men I've ever met. If he was in the dining room at night for dinner, by the time he left the dining room, he knew practically everybody there on a first name basis. I mean, he was just born to be with people. And he made his career actually traveling the country um, promoting um, programs for like big businesses, like the AMP store he worked for for years, doing openings for them and such as that. He went around and, and basically brought people in because he was such a magnetic personality. Everybody wanted to know Harry. Um, well, there came a time when Harry and Chris crossed paths. Um, it wasn't in the dining room, because after dinner, Chris always exited, and he entered the dining room as soon as it opened. He always exited and sat in the lobby to read his newspaper for an hour before he would get up, walk to the front desk, announce to the desk clerk that he was retiring for the night, and go across the room, or the street, to his favorite room. Well. Harry was there one night. Harry always came with his horses. Big tra trailer up, three or four horses with his wife. Boarded them over at a place we call White Gates in Grafton. And he would ride every day. And he just looked like he was made to sit a horse. I mean, he was just a marvelous, uh, rugged looking character. Well, Harry had been in the dining room, but Chris had already left. So Chris had come up to the desk this one night to announce his retiring for the evening. 
And Harry happened to be coming out from the dinner at this, at this time and looked down and saw Chris. And he said, well there, young fella. And he said, I don't think I've ever seen you here before. He says, what's your name? And Chris said, oh, and my name is Christian Gangloff. He said, well. He said, I can't imagine we haven't seen one another before. He said, what do you do for a living? And Chris said, well, I'm a lawyer. Oh my God, said Harry, his huge hand slammed down on the desk. He said, another one of you blood-sucking sons of guns. He said, honest to God, he looked down and he says, let me tell you, he said, let me ask you this. He says, doesn't your conscience ever bother you? And Chris is looking at him and he said, well, yes, he said, it, it, it did once when I thought I had other charge to claim. <laughs> and at this point, Harry <coughs> claps him on the shoulder. I thought it was going to crush him. You know, grabs him and he's roaring with laughter, you know. And Chris is astonished at, at the effect that his joke is on. <laughs> And, and he stood there staring at them. Well, they became fast friends. He escorted Chris across the street. And every day after that, you could see them walking around town together. And it was just so comical to see these two guys together on the street. You know, one yeah, towering over the other, you know, complete personality. But the result of it was that at that moment, Chris learned that he could be funny. <laughs> and so every time he came to the end after that, he always had a new joke to tell. <laughs> always. And he would tell it to everybody, the bartender, the waitress, the everybody got the joke. And any guests that could be drawn into conversation with him. And so to end, what I'm going to tell you is Chris's last joke, the last joke he made before he, he finally had to stop coming to the end at the age of 94. So this was his 93rd year. He drove up from Bronxville, New York, and came to the end for his last visit. And he came up to the desk and signed the big, big desk register. And then the desk clerk stopped. I was there. And he said, well, you know, he said, a very funny thing he said happened to me today on the way to the end. He said, you know, on my way up, it's a long journey. And he said, I make a habit of stopping at this small monastery, he said, that's about halfway up. And he said, uh, they have a little dinette there. And he said, gosh, they make the most wonderful chocolate cheesecake. And he said, I always like to stop there and have a slice of cheesecake and a cup of coffee and then continue my journey. And he said, you know, this year I was on my way up. And my God, I pulled into the yard. He said, it wasn't a little dinette anymore with chocolate cheesecake. He said, they turned it into a fish and chips joint. <laughs> he said, I couldn't believe it. I was so disappointed. He said, you know, I thought I'd go in since I had time, and I'd try their fish and chips. He said, so I locked the car and walked to the door. He said, I entered, entered the diner, and he said, I looked over, and there was a fellow standing there working, and he said, I walked up to him, and I said, uh, hi. He said, uh, are you the fish fryer? And the guy said, no, no, I'm the chipmunk. <laughs>
There was a guy who worked for my dad years ago, and he cut up slag wood, uh, uh, Gib Clayton. He lived in West Elton, and quite a few years, my dad had let a lot of the guys go because there wasn't much business, and Gib came to the mill, and he'd squat right down. He must have been 80-some. I couldn't even do it now. And uh, he visited with us, and he said they had a quarrel with him and his wife, at Alice, and he came, I want to see your dad, so I took him up to see my father, and God, he came, I said, come up and eat supper with us. I said, okay, so I took him up to my house, and my wife had supper, and her folks are there, and uh, he came in, went over to the sink, washed his hands, and I said, we're actually having roast groundhog. He said, you know, I like groundhog. And, uh, he didn't have any teeth, and he gummed the heck right out that. <laughs> he gummed the heck out of that roast beef, and uh, pretty soon he said, you know, I guess I'd better go home, he said, Alan. I said, yeah, you better go home, I'll take you home. So he got up, and he went to the, uh, he went to go to the door, and, and he had to walk in, you know what, toot. <laughs> my brother-in-law was just about crying, cause, and I took him, I went out and got my pickup and headed down through, and went down around the corner, Beret Marie's, his estate trooper coming like a shot, and he actually, be a, he was a guy up in the garage with Doyle, and, I put in what Danny's house used to be, and he backed right up, and he said, is that Mr. Clayton in there with you, Alan? I said, yeah. He said, uh, i got to take him home. He said, his wife called, and she's some worried about him. And uh, he'd asked me just before that, he said, when we get down to you, stop down to Johnny's store and get me some beers and cigarettes. I said, oh, yeah, I'll do that. So I, I said, I went over to the pickup, and I said, you've got to go with the state trooper that your wife's looking for you. So. He got up, thank you, Alan, for the supper and everything. He went over and got in, just started to put his foot in the cruiser. He looked in at that trooper. He said, you stop down to Johnny's and get me some beer and cigarettes. <laughs> I, said, I can't let you have any beer or cigarettes in this car. He said, the heck with you. And he come right back, got the pickup. <laughs> was shaking his head and I headed down the road and I pulled into Johnny's and the trooper went by and he was still shaking his head. <laughs> that, was, that was a true thing. <laughs> well, we played for square dances for years and I always think about uh, John Robinson, Henry and Paul and all the Robinsons, one time uh, they had a family reunion at my folks' barn and we all played. And another thing I have to think about, John Robinson came up and Henry and another guy, they worked at the Putney School and uh, they wanted to order some lumber. Well, somewhere along the line we ended up, my dad's out and back there, he had a piano and a banjo and a barrel of cider. And, uh, <laughs> needless to say, we didn't get much. Lumba saw that. I'll play a square dance too. <laughs>